lot on some many of the labor issues, but I also thought that it would be good to bring in bring in this issue of regulatory, the regulatory part. Um, and one of the things that I think is really interesting, particularly because trade, you know, trade economists and others love to look at non-tariff measures. You know, from a practitioner's point of view, someone who's involved in the U.S. government and U.S. government uh, trade negotiations and things like that, every law another country has that I don't like that blocks my product is a non-tariff barrier. You can't, it's a, a very difficult thing to justify. And the United States and Europe, who are the ones who are always beating up others because of their non-tariff measures, we're now negotiating with ourselves. And we're saying, well, well wait a minute, that's not a non-tariff barrier, that's a perfectly legitimate law. And so it's, it's how you would possibly inventory non-tariff measures would be a really interesting thing if you were to say, I mean, this idea of mapping all federal legislation governing product and service, product service supply, well, that would be, you can say that they're all non-tariff measures and, and how you're going to calculate the impact of something like that on trade would be an interesting one for me. I think that one of the things that's interesting, however, is that in the trade world, as, as tariff barriers at the border have gone down, there is more of a focus on non-tariff barriers. And certainly in the context of TTIP, you know, everyone was talking about if the U.S. and the EU do, do a, a, an agreement with each other, they've got relatively low barriers at the border. All the barriers are in the background. That is, they're non-tariff measures that create barriers to trade, and we're going to get rid of them. There's truth to this, but you need to be careful using terms like this particularly those of you who are in the academic world, even more people like I who was in the US government, the government world, when we use certain words, we send connotations that have absolutely nothing to do with the reality of what a trade agreement is trying to achieve. And I think that this, this that a need to be precise is really important. So the one thing that I think, you know, it's, it's striking to me how often people refuse to go to first principles. Okay? The absolute first principle in trade and investment law is if I want to sell my product in your territory, if I want to make an investment in your territory, my product has to meet your legal requirements. Right? That is, that's simply the case, and, you know, unless you're doing it illegally because it's not being enforced or it's being smuggled. Every country that has a body of law, that law governs the supply of a product, the safety level of the product, uh, or whatever. That law governs what any investor, domestic or foreign, can do in a ter territory. That is such a fundamental precept that we don't say it, and we should. Because a lot of your work is on labor issues and labor law. The starting point is always going to be what is the labor law in a country? And you can say it's not good enough. I would like it to have this, that, and the other thing to be better, to be fairer, whatever the case may be. I would like your product rules to be more scientifically based because that would be better. But those aspects, I think, again, we need to be conscious that there are some normative, there are places where normative judgments are being brought in, sometimes not being explicitly stated as normative. This is where I think the TTIP experience, and my experience in particular working with European and American regulators, is directly relevant. Because one of the keys, key things that I have found, and I think that this goes for global trade agreements and global trade law, is that if you start on the premise that it's the law that each party has when they're trying to reach a trade agreement, they're trying to figure out what to do with it, 
I either need to be able to convince you to change your law because somehow it's wrong, in which case presumably I have an evidence base that would convince you that that should be changed, which I can think would be a perfect case would be when we were trying to prove to the Japanese that their snow really wasn't that much different and their skis didn't necessarily only have to be made in Japan. Now, these were things, this is, that's a non-tariff barrier, but that's one where you have demonstrable evidence. Evidence, and an evidence case that can be looked at and presumably withstand some sort of scientific rigor in the sense that I can replicate the data that you're providing me. That there is a reason for having this idea of scientific evidence because it is something that goes to that underlying, this is not just a normative judgment, this is saying that where you are is way outside the standard deviations, then I can make a reasonable case that your law, I can argue that your law should be changed. <clears throat> when you're talking Aside from doing something like that, where I'm trying to convince you, and in the context of a trade negotiation to make you change your law, aside from something like that, what, what do you mean by addressing non-tariff barriers in trade agreements? What are the social implications of this? This has come up because, again, people went into TTIP saying, well, we're going to address these regulatory issues that, where there are differences between the United States and Europe. That implies, based on what I just said on non-tariff measures, that each side is going to ask the other to change its laws. And this is where I think the important thing is the, the important thing that people need to bear in mind is what is the scope of what we're trying of what the two sides are actually trying to do? What are they looking at? What sorts of tools can they reasonably bring into this? And why are they doing it at all? Here I think that the, the key for me is the lesson that I have learned in my work as a practitioner, because that's kind of what I'm supposed to bring in, is that when you're doing regulatory cooperation where you're not making evidence-based case that somehow what you're doing is wrong, The critical aspect is the relationship between the regulators for that product or service or whatever. There has to be a trust and confidence level between the regulators. And in that sense, regulatory cooperation, regulatory work that is more on a cooperative basis rather than a you must change your rules basis is not subject and cannot be subject to most favored nation. The basic hallmark of the trade, the, the, of the WTO and the general trade rule. And I think that, that is a, that's a really important aspect. From my experience, You can only, in the context of a trade agreement, look at regulations that directly, and I want to underscore that, that directly affect the product or the service that's, being, that's going across the board. That is a critical, you can't be looking as a, when you're trying to promote trade between two, two people, you can't be looking at their internal legal regime. Because to say that we are going to be going deep into the internal regime of someone else to change it gets to be really difficult. It then starts moving more into the areas that you're talking about, which is how do you use a trade agreement to convince another party that it's even in their interest to change their labor law one way or another. That, however, is different from the regulatory part of a trade agreement. So I'm trying to make these, these distinctions. So what I saw of many of the titles of the work, and I'm sorry I haven't been here to see and read the, the things, that your minimum wage law, whether or not you allow a union, these are 
your domestic laws. You don't do regulatory cooperation in the sense of a trade agreement on those domestic law. You don't, they have an indirect impact on the trade flows between countries because they create fair or unfair conditions for workers. But that's different from the laws that apply to the direct provision of a service, cross borders, or direct provision of direct sale of goods. The concept in TTIP that people have been focusing on, or that the two sides are focusing on, understands this. It's an underlying assumption that we're not going to all of the all of the regulations in everyone's. We're not going to try to do something about water. You know, what's your water? What are your water standards, and how do those affect trade? What are your minimum wage laws, and how do those affect trade? That's a different part. That's the sustainable development part of TTIP, where those issues will be discussed. Where, frankly, I think they'll be thinking much more about third countries than between themselves. What they're looking for instead is first to try to spell out what do we think good regulatory practices are and how they affect products, you know, uh, trade between us, and then second, whether or not you can have certain horizontal rules that are would be appropriate for two trading partners. And then the third thing is to look at the actual regulations and whether or not in individual sectors the levels of protection between two sides are similar enough that you can find a way to build a bridge. Because in this sense, a quote, regulatory barrier to trade can be said to exist if and only if the regulators on the both sides feel can demonstrate to themselves and demonstrate to their public and their politicians that oversee them that the level of protection is effectively the same, yeah? even if, it's a, even if it's, it's a little bit different. And if it is effectively the same, then you should be able to build a bridge between them. The level of protection, and this is another reason you can't do MFN, is not just what's in your law, it's how it's enforced and how effectively it's enforced. Because certainly in the United States and in Europe, where the regulators are politically answerable to, to Congress or to the European Parliament or to member state parliaments, they can't have a trade agreement the social implications of having a trade agreement that is identified as being a source of unsafe products or unsafe cir circumstances are not just social. For them, it's political and can damn well be illegal. You know, in some cases, they could find themselves going to jail if they, if they do things wrong. So that political accountability is, again, not an MFN thing. And I think that it's, I, I wanted to bring this in because I, I to me, a large part of the discussion about regulatory cooperation misses some of these points. The last thing I'm going to, to say on this, you know, in addition to the fact that it's not MFN, that it, it, it depends on the regulators knowing and trusting each other, having ascertained whether or not the levels of protection are, are, are similar, is you would want where you have to a regulator's job is to balance between the costs and benefits to society of imposing a regulation. You have a social goal that's determined that you want to achieve. You recognize that's not cost-free. If we did that, all cars would be Humvees because everyone knows that if you drive a Humvee or a tank, you won't die if you just hit it, get a fender bender. Right? That would be ridiculous. So you have to find a balance in between these things. When you're a regulator, your job is to protect your people. You are inherently focused on your domestic things. When you're looking at these costs and benefits, you aren't necessarily looking at the non-tariff measure aspect of it. That's not your job. Your job is instead to say, OK, I'm looking at the costs and benefits. This is where we can draw the line. This does, achieves the trick. When you have a large economic relationship between parties, then it's arguable 
that if you're only looking at the domestic costs and benefits, you're missing a significant part of the benefit and cost if you're not looking at the external costs and benefits as well of the, the rules that you bring in. So you could have a system whereby you just expand a cost-benefit analysis to look at the impact on significant amounts of trade. And I think that that's another aspect that people would want it to achieve, or some would like to see whether or not an agreement like TTIP could bring about in a way that does not, uh, again, may not necessarily be transferable to other trade agreements that the United States and the EU do with others. I'm going to stop there um, because I do need to leave, I need to leave some room for, for questions. Um, but I have done a paper that goes over this in, to some extent um, and let me just take your questions. Maybe a comment on a question. Um, you started Peter, by saying that we should remember the fundamental principle of trade investments, namely that um, the host countries' regulation.